Please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 26. Number 26. Genesis 1, 26. Moses, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records for us, and God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. I want to focus in on that part of it. And in verse 27, you see, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. As you look at this, you're seeing that man is in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Now what does that mean? Well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we learn from Jesus in John 3. So it can't be that the likeness is physical. It must be that the spirit of man, I like to say the real you, that will never cease to exist, and the writer of Hebrews says, God fathered that spirit, is made in the image of God. But what does it mean to be made in the likeness of the image of God? Well, we may not fully understand all that means, but it does mean that we bear the, the moral stamp of God upon us. We have that which is innate to us. We would say it's natural to us as far as the way we conduct ourselves and the way we might describe how birds and animals operate because they are genetically programmed so to do. When a bird begins to build a nest in the spring, it didn't study up on that from the other birds over the years and learn how to build a nest. It did it because God programmed it genetically so to do at a given time. So it is a lot of things. But man has free will. Man has free will. So he can choose to do what's right or he can choose to do what's wrong. And left to himself, he manages to do what's wrong. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Thus we have revelation from God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to give us the direction that we need to give us the guidance we need to get us through this life so heaven can be our home. But the part I want to focus in on here is that part of us that is in the image of God bearing the moral likeness of God. What does that mean? Well, one thing it means that we've talked about many times is that all men have a sense of oughtness about them. If you go to the most primitive of peoples, you will find that they come up with various laws, no matter how far those laws may be from God's laws, to govern things like ownership of property, how life should be dealt with, even to the point many times of telling the truth or not telling the truth, Forbidding lies, though, as I say, these pagan peoples without God's direction and His word may have them all mixed up and they may be very contrary to the truth on those matters taught in God's word. But that doesn't alleviate, why did they try to do that anyway? Since they never heard of the God of the Bible, they never seen a Bible, why do they do that? I was watching a YouTube presentation a couple of weeks ago thereabouts. And frankly, I wasn't aware there were that many indigenous people that were still 
not in contact with what we call the civilized world. And this was about, the, the video was made in 2013 in Brazil, the headwaters of the Amazon River. And I didn't realize there was such an area that really is still basically non-explored and, and various, we would call them Indian tribes, live out there and several of those tribes have never made contact with um, other people there that would be considered civilized. Well, there was a man who made it his last work. He was an older man at that time, in fact, an anthropologist to try to make contact with these, with these Indians. And it just so happened he had his video camera when across the river, which was the boundary line at, a, at an Indian camp, some of these people came out of seclusion. And they found out later it was because they, they were being attacked by folks and they were seeking help. And I forgot, three or four or five of them, I forget how many. Of course, they didn't have any clothes on. And they were, it, it was really interesting to see them trying to make contact with them. They, they didn't know their language. The video was a very good one, by the way. It just happened he had it there. But it's, it carried through with them finally making contact, and they were very dubious, and they had their bows and arrows, and they were very much uh, being very careful for fear that these Indians would begin to shoot them. Well, they let them come into the, these more, quote, civilized, unquote, Indians' camp. They had no sense of of various things about that these things belong to these folks in the village. Now, fast forward about six to seven months, I can't remember exactly which, and they had become more involved with them. They had built trust between one another. They had begun to be able to communicate far more. And they interviewed them. And they were asking them about particular matters, about why they were where they were and so forth. I found this very interesting. They all had clothes on at that time. And if you go back with me to when they first went into that town, one of the first things they began to take, and not thinking about it owned by somebody, being owned by somebody else, they began to take all these clothes and just walk <laughs> off with them. They were trying to get them to say, no, you know, you can't do that. But they were scared to say it too strongly lest they get in a fight with them and all this kind of thing. But after they were able to build this trust and months had passed, they were able to communicate. They asked them how they liked wearing clothes. Oh, they said they liked it very much. Would you go back to the way you were living before you came and made contact and learned what you've learned in these past months. And I thought they made a very interesting thing, and this is going to tie in, made in the image of God and the moral likeness of God. Would you give up the clothes? No, we don't want to give up our clothes. For when we saw others with clothes on, we wanted them because we were ashamed. Nobody talked in the Bible. They didn't know Genesis from whatever book. Why? Why were they ashamed? What difference does it make whether you have clothes on or not? And I thought, well, that's what Adam and Eve said after they sinned. We were ashamed. You can't see that and not realize that being made in the image of God makes people aware of things. They make a, make a mess out of it in covering themselves up. Adam and Eve did that with the fig leaves. I know what you're trying to do, God says, but that's not sufficient. So he made them the proper clothes. But to make that comment, here are pagan primitive people only in contact with so-called civilized people for a few months and they were ashamed of being naked. What has happened to the people around about us who are supposedly learned and civilized? And they're not ashamed. Well, what does that tell me? It tells me that you can stifle, for lack of a better way to put it, natural inclinations. Or you can enhance them. But there's got to be something there to work with in the first place. And God made us with that wherewithal could, that could be worked with. 
And when you read uh, the situation before the flood, or when you read Paul's review of how far the Gentiles went and leaving God and embracing all these things, we need to remember at one time everybody believed in God, just like Adam and Eve. Everybody did. Somebody had to leave that, and so the, Paul would say they desired not to retain God in their knowledge. And the only reason that you could do that is because you want to do like you want to do, and that's where that free will comes in. I'm either going to live my life seeking to know God's will, seeking God, looking beyond the physical and the material, or else I'm going to live on the material plane doing as I please and seeking to make everything work to suit me. That's called selfishness. So what makes the gospel appear to, uh, appeal to people? The Word of God, what makes it appeal to people? He made us so that there would be that appeal. It's always been interesting to me that an atheist who says God does not exist and man is nothing but an accident and matter in motion, but he's always trying to deal with God from the standpoint of getting rid of him. Why? If I am nothing but the product of multiple millions of years of accidental chance evolution, why would I have even, what would there be about me they would even entertain or come up or be caused to think of what the Bible describes God to be or any kind of deity or anything spiritual. Why would I even think of devils or angels or any kind of spirits? Why would I do that? Well, God has set eternity in our heart. There is that part of us fathered by God and it bears the imprint of God. Now, we can... Let it cause us to seek God and to search for Him. Paul used that reasoning on Mars Hill in Acts 17 and even said He's not far from any of us. Or we can reject everything there is about that which leads us to God and to service to Him. Now, let me say this about moral law. Moral law has always been binding since the beginning. The patriarchal age, there was no written law. Basically, the patriarchal age was governed by moral law. In other words, it's always been wrong to lie. It's always been wrong to murder. It's always been wrong to steal. It's always been wrong to be covetous, which is a form of stealing, the mental process that leads to taking something that doesn't belong to you. Those things have always been wrong. Now what you have in the way of special, such as with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob under the patriarchal age, the father rule period where God dealt with man through the heads of the families, the patriarch, is that when they worshipped, they were led by the father as a priest, and they worshipped by offering sacrifices. And God at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, he would at different ways and different times speak to men such as Abraham and tell him to get out of Ur of the Galdees and do the things that he did. But as far as the general everyday living in service to God, it was basically moral law. And then they were worshiped by sacrifices and special revelations given in different ways by God to them. They would go do the various things. But then after 2,500 long years, God, in the unfolding of the scheme of redemption, for you might say he was headed down to Pentecost through Christ and the establishment of the church in the gospel age. He has to let man grow and to develop, if you please. And I don't know what all was involved in that. God did, and he worked it. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. But then came the law of Moses. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And these moral laws were what we call codified. What does that mean? It means they were written down. So when you look at the law of Moses, you have moral laws, and then you have laws pertaining to their worship, things peculiar to their worship, religious matters. 
Now, here's something peculiar about our moral law. It is right in the very nature of the case. It flows from our moral nature, a sense of oughtness. It ought to be this way. It ought not be that way. That's in us if we're normal. And we always say, well, that ought to have been this way or that ought to have been that way or I ought to have done that or I ought not have done that. So the moral law is there. And it was codified for 1,500 years in the law of Moses through that law the Jews approached God. Then with the fulfillment of the law, the coming of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his ascension back to heaven, there came the New Testament period, the Christian age. Those moral laws are the same. Whether it's patriarchy, unwritten, or whether it's codified in the law of Moses, or whether it is recorded as part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, it's always wrong to murder, it's always wrong to steal, and so on. Now, when we study the Bible as a part of proper division of the Word, we have to recognize that. And we have to realize why it is that men who don't even believe in God and don't know anything about the Bible still set about to have laws that regulate their lives. Now, they may be all mixed up as far as the truth of God's Word is concerned, but they still try to do it. And I like to, again, go back to what I said a moment ago when it comes to Adam and Eve. They, after sinning, knew they were naked, and they tried to patch things up with fig leaf. God said that's insufficient, but they had to have the wherewithal to want to do it. And God showed them what it meant not to be really naked and be ashamed. So when we come to Exodus uh, chapter 20, I think that's one of the great chapters of the Bible. We have the giving of the Ten Commandments to the Jews. And I want to remind you that the law of Moses and all that that entails was given to the Jews and only to the Jews. And Moses makes that clear in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It was given to us, not to our fathers, but even us, or even all of us alive here this day. Now, it is true that there were proselytes, Gentiles, who decided, took it upon themselves, to embrace the law. God allowed that. But the law of Moses was given to the Jews, and he never did say, go out and preach the law of Moses to every creature. Because he was unfolding the scheme of redemption. Uh, that was to make sin exceeding sinful. When you write something down and you read it and you know this is forbidden or it's authorized and you violate it, you have a special consciousness of sin. That's what Paul meant when he says it made sin exceedingly sinful. It was also a law to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 24. It is a system of shadows and types because in it we see prefigured the realities of the gospel in the church. And you can see that very well if you'll study the book of Hebrews. But when we come then to the Ten Commandments that we hear so much of, we need to understand that we're reading basically the codification of moral law. You have the Sabbath law, which was not a moral thing. But most of them are moral law. And they were already under those things. They knew better than to do a lot of the things they did because it had been taught them all down through the years under the patriarchy. Look with me to the Exodus 20. And when you come down to verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, remember, Romans 1 makes it clear that one time everybody believed in the one God. As Paul declared, there's one God in Ephesians 4. They had to reject that. All idolatry 
is condemned. It always has been. Whether it's patriarchy, whether it's the Mosaic law, or whether it's the gospel of Christ. What is an idol? Anything put before God. Our pantheon of idols today is not the same pantheon of idols as it was in the first century. Now, they had the same thing there that we call make idols, but they had another pantheon of idols too. And you'll remember, and Kenswell pointed that out in the Wednesday night study of the Minor Prophets, that idolatry was one of the besetting sins of Israel. It only got burnt out of them permanently by the Babylonian captivity. Never had a problem with idolatry after that, as far as the Jews are concerned. They got a lot of other sins, but they never had a problem with idolatry after that. And when you look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul's writing to the church of Galatia concerning their conduct, conduct, you'll see that it condemns idolatry. And it even broadens the definition, 1 Corinthians 5, 11 and Colossians 3, 5, talk about covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul would say, I covet your prayers, but then he would say, covetous, which is idolatry. Well, it's that strong desire for something to the point that it comes between you and God. An example of that would be the rich young ruler. His riches were more important to him than obeying Christ. Even after he asked, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was told, you go sell all you've got and give it to the poor. Well, that doesn't mean everybody with an overabundance of things must sell all they have and give it to the poor. It just means that Jesus knew those things he possessed was more important to him than serving God. Now, that could be a number of different things. But strictly speaking, an idol in your heart is anything that comes before God in serving Him. Then the other is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And of course, that's aimed at the kind of idolatry that really predominated and governed <laughs> things at that time. That is, the, the common the common idolatry of the day and it would be around for a long time to come and it varied from culture to culture just the kind of idols they had but nevertheless false gods and idols now I find it interesting that the Roman Catholic Church who teaches that you ought to obey the Ten Commandments teach their members that I don't know whether you ever noticed this or not but they they leave this commandment out of, of the list and, and they subdivide, subdivide the tenth commandment into two parts so they'll have ten. Well, why do they do that? Because fundamentally they worship statues, icons, and relics. And that would uh, certainly violate, don't make it the any graven image. So they work it that way, and that's the view they have of Scripture when the clergy and the magisterium, the teaching college of the church, decides that they can do that, and that's God doing it, for they think they're guided by the Spirit like Peter and Paul, so they do that. That's the reason they don't believe the Bible. The Bible only is the only rule of faith and practice. It's the Bible plus the magisterium, because they think that it all must be updated as time goes by. In the New Testament, the worship of anything other than God is strictly forbidden. Romans 1, 23. And if you go down a little further to verse 25, in Revelation 19, 10. Worship God. And while we sometimes don't notice this, God visits the consequences of sin on the children but he does not cause them to be guilty of what the parents did or their parents guilty of what the kids did that was wrong but the consequences may affect a whole host of folks bad parents sinful parents the consequences of their sin may be felt by a host of people and yet those people never committed sin and that happens all the time. Just this morning's news, as it happens around here seemingly very often, a woman got out to help somebody on the interstate who was sick, 
got run over by a drunk driver. Well, she was trying to do a good deed. But she was killed by somebody who committed sin. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, in order that they not violate this command, the Jews never spoke this tetragamatron, as it's called, this four-letter name of God. Used to, we heard Jehovah, if you didn't hear Lord. And the King James Version will talk about the Lord. American Standard employs Jehovah. Jehovah was invented many years after, not that really many years ago, several hundred years ago, but uh, Hebrew is Yahweh. Now, they have to uh, add a vowel in there to even pronounce Yahweh, and they don't know for sure. They, even the Hebrew scholars don't know what that vowel was, but they say Yahweh just so they can pronounce it. To take the name of God in vain is to take it lightly, irreverently, and blasphemously. And that's done all day long every day in this nation. OMG. You realize using it that way, you're sinning against God every time. And people don't give account for that. And then, of course, I grew up listening to this, oh, Lordy mercy, or my Lord. People not even thinking about what they're doing. So we need to be mindful of the fact that to use something in vain is use it appropriately, not use it with the proper reverence and respect. And this is especially true with the name of God. And when you look into the New Testament of Christ in Mark 7, 21 through 23, Mark 10 verse, or rather Matthew 10 verse 28, and Hebrews 12 verses 28 through 29, you see rather quickly that God is a consuming fire. He will exact vengeance on those who do not respect His Word and especially reverence Him. Then, too, there is the one that is not necessarily a moral law pertaining to the Jews in the Mosaical age. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We need to say something about that because the Sabbath day was not the first day of the week, but it was the seventh day of the week. It was what we call Saturday. It's never been Sunday. The word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word that simply means rest. When God created the earth in six days, he ceased his labors. It's said that he rested from his labors on the seventh day. Never is it applied as a Christian Sabbath. What is the Christian Sabbath? Well, according to Hebrews 4.1 and verses 9 through 10, that's heaven itself. That's our rest. We have ceased from our labors when we get to heaven. In fact, when you look at what the New Testament teaches, we're not taught to keep any day as they kept the Sabbath day, Colossians 2, 14 through 16. When you think of what we do on the first day of the week, it's what we do on the first day of the week that's kept. It's not the day itself. It's what God ordains or authorizes to be done, such as the assembling of ourselves together to worship God on the first day of the week. Now, God did this thousands of years before he ever hallowed that day and put it into the law of Moses. But he said, that's the reason I'm putting this seventh day of rest in for you Jews is because I rested from the creation on the seventh day. Notice that it's Exodus 20 where it's enjoined upon the Jews. And that was thousands of years after God created the world. Then there is honor thy father and thy mother. Well, it may come as a surprise to folks, but honoring of parents includes obedience to parents. Ephesians 6, 1 and Proverbs 1, 8. And when it comes time in life, honoring parents means taking care of them when they don't have anybody else to take care of them. Matthew 15, 3 through 9. You'll see Paul dealing with widows and how that the members of the family should be mindful of that before the church is even charged. Well, of course, if members of the family won't take care of a widow, then the church should step in and help. But nevertheless, that's a responsibility of the family. Well, all you have to do is look around about us and see, look at all the responsibilities of the family. It's being neglected, rejected. Even the need for marriage and the family or the role of husband and wife and father and mother 
just doesn't exist much. The promise that came with the command that you'll live long on the earth really is seen in their living under the law while they were in the land of Canaan. They would be able to be there as long as they kept the law. They only were afflicted, as the prophets have pointed out, and so abundantly taught in all these prophets as Ken started on Wednesday night. It's clear that you're being punished because you won't do what you were told in the law. And though prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet was sent to you, showing you your sins and need to repent, and God's bore with you for years and years, you won't do it, so you're going to be punished. Ten northern tribes, the Syrians. The southern kingdom, comprised of Judah primarily, and Benjamin, the Babylonians. And because God had not yet brought the whole scheme of redemption together in Christ, then there was a remnant, and they came back. And they were there, and the law was restored. God kept them in existence until Christ came. And as soon as he had done what he came to do, and the Jews rejected him, they didn't stay long after that. God permitted Rome to destroy them off the earth. And when he destroyed, when uh, Titus and the Roman legions destroyed Jerusalem with it, the temple, they made it impossible for the Jews to ever know what tribe they were from, and thus they can't have the Levitical priesthood. And if they went over there this day and built the temple exactly according to the specifications of the law of Moses, they wouldn't know who should do the things the priest only should do because they don't know who's of the tribe of Levi and who's not. And they certainly don't know then who is of the high priest household. They can never ever worship again exactly as the law of Moses set up. Jews approach God today the same way anybody else does through the gospel of Jesus Christ. People talk about, oh, they're God-chosen people. No, they're not. They were at one time. They didn't know then even what they were chosen for. <laughs> they were chosen to keep God's name alive in the world by keeping His laws and to stay around until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, which was Jesus Christ. Well, what's amazing to me is that God in His infinite wisdom and power, with all of their disobedience and rebellion over the years, just read what Stephen had said about it, got him killed by them in Acts 7 and 8, that they went right ahead and did as they pleased. So it's obvious that God's always expected that children honor their parents and obey their parents, take care of their parents as the time needed, even as parents are ordained of God to bring children to the world, to rear their children, as he says in uh, Ephesians 6, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Then he says, Thou shalt not kill. This is called a lot of trouble with people who don't understand what he's saying. In the Hebrew it says, Thou shalt do no murder. Not all killing was condemned by this command. If it is, we'd have a contradiction in the Bible. Because you'll remember God commanded the Israelites to kill in war. It's amusing to hear this passage quoted to condemn capital punishment. Since the punishment for violation of this command was death. Exodus 21 verse 12. And then you have it taught in the New Testament that civil rulers don't bear the sword in vain. I think it's interesting, too, to note that all these folks opposed to capital punishment will kill unborn babies by the millions. Now, you figure that out. That's where you have men left to themselves to do as they please, to suit themselves and to reject God and how he wants things done. So murder is condemned in the New Testament, Romans 1.29. In 1 Timothy 1, 9, but all killing is not murder. It's implied in the New Testament that it would be proper to put such murderers to death in such places as Romans 1, 32, 13, 4, and Acts 25, 11. That's the power of the civil government. I would spend some time here, but it's a sermon worthy of itself concerning the design and purpose of civil government in the mind of God and revealed to us in the Bible. All civil government from God's perspective was ever meant to do was to make a place where good people could live in safety. All these other things that civil government does, 
might be debatable as to whether that's good for people or not. But the fundamental purpose by God revealed in the Bible for civil government is to protect good people as the Bible defines what's good. Then, of course, he says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is fornication with or by a married person. Fornication from pornea means illicit sexual relations outside of the marriage. So when you got adultery, it means at least one person involved in that fornication was married. Not only adultery, but all forms of fornication are condemned in the New Testament. All you got to do is read the works of the flesh, Galatians 5 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 18, where he has another list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And as Peter writes in 2 Peter 2 and verse 14, those who, contrary to the scripture, scriptures, unscripturally divorce or remarry, are guilty of adultery. Could be planner by Jesus' own words as Matthew, by inspiration of the Spirit, recorded it in Matthew 19, 9. We just don't want to believe it. We want to do what we want to do, which has been always the problem with man. Then thou shalt not steal. This is another one. I hope you realize that many of these can be expanded. But thou shalt not steal. This command recognizes the right of private property. Now watch this. I'm not saying you can't be a Christian in a socialist nation. But I'm telling you, if it recognizes the right of private property, then it doesn't very well uphold socialism that says the government owns everything. And that's an important point to keep in mind. In the New Testament, we're forbidden to steal, Ephesians 4, 28. Well, I don't think governments ought to steal, do you? Yet they can tax. But evidently, there must be some reasonableness in tax. So does anybody have a right from God to forbid a person owning his own stuff? And I can say, this is mine. Well, if you read through the Bible you'll see that the Bible talks a lot about what's yours and how you use it, that God has put it in your care. But it's yours. When Ananias and Sapphira sinned by lying about what they gave, Peter reminds them while it was on, was it not, while it was your own, was it not under your own power? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. Don't tell a falsehood with the intent to deceive somebody. In the New Testament, all lying is forbidden. Revelation 21.8. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. You may say, well, this is a little white lie. Well, little white lies, black lies are all believing they've got their part. It didn't say according to how bad you think it is. If it's a falsehood and you told it as if the truth to deceive somebody, then it is forbidden. Wouldn't that go a long way in this nation today if people just followed that? There's never any excuse for lying. Now, it ought to be taught, first of all, yes, from the pulpit and in the classes the church teaches, but first of all, in the home. Don't lie to your kids. I've seen cases over and over again where parents just to get rid of their kids when they're little would lie to them because they don't argue with them. They won't tell them no, make them stick with it. They say, well, they don't have it. Well, they do. There it is. Kid can't read. He doesn't know. They lie. Well, you teach that child that. He's going to grow up doing the same thing or worse. Thou shalt not covet. The idea of covet is to lust after, to be greedy for. It's the love of things. It's the love of money. The commandment fit, forbids us lusting after the things of others. And that also says people can have things that belong to them. It's from the desire from this desire that envy, that stealing, that murder, that adultery arises. Countries coveting what some other country has. You just watch. When it comes to wars, whatever the war is, I promise you, right down at the base root of the reason of that war is covetousness. In the New Testament, all coveting is forbidden. It's possible to covet money and things in general, but the love of money is forbidden, and coveting is described as idolatry by the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul in 1 Timothy 6.10 and Colossians 3, verse 5. The Bible says, having therefore food and raiment, let us be content, 1 Timothy 6, 5 through 9. You see, psychologists are trying to make a whole lot of folks who covet feel content, and they never will. But if you want to have contentment, realize what life's about, realize the trenches of it, that we're pilgrims here, that we're to serve God and be happy with what you got, and you'll find contentment. If you don't do that, you won't. 
So what are we to say? Well, we're not under the Ten Commandments today. Colossians 3, 14 through 16, Romans 7, 16 through 17. We're under the authority of Christ. He said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. It's been given to me, Matthew 28, 18. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father by him. Thus, we serve Christ by obeying the teachings of the Ten Commandments. And that doesn't mean we are free to steal and lie, and etc. No way whatsoever. Because we've seen that the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the New Testament of the Bible, the law under which we now live, prohibits these things. And Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. But it's important to understand the difference, and we close where we started, with our moral nature and what moral law is. And then to realize how it's been wrong to lie and to steal and to covet and such things, murder, ever since time began. It was codified in the law of Moses, and those moral laws were codified in the New Testament. And here's one thing I want you to remember. You can be the finest moral person in the world, and that won't save you. You still must hear the gospel Believe it and obey it to be saved. Moral people in their morality alone can't be saved. It is by obeying the gospel of Christ, the power of God and salvation, Romans 1.16. If you need to obey the gospel this morning, we beg of you to think about it, to think about yourself in the light of God's word and how you're made and who made you and how you think and how you determine, how you view things. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.